what we're doing, we're discussing this concept of authority out to be 26 lessons because we'll have one class that uh, we teach the lesson and then at the end of each class there are a, uh, anywhere from 6 to 12 uh, questions and the next Sunday we're going to come in and we're going to use those for discussion uh, and so you'll get kind of a double whammy on the lesson hopefully and I hope we have some good discussion because if not uh, we may get out of here in 10 minutes. Okay, uh, with my answers to these questions. But hopefully you've done a little thinking and a little uh, uh, about what's going on and we'll have some good discussion. Anybody else need one? Study of authority. She's got one back there. She need one more up here. There you go. <clears throat> All right. Turn all the way to the back page because that's where we are. Um, the first, um, I, I wanted you just to think about those words that we talked about last week that center around authority so that we could discuss some, uh, we could get into a lot of detail uh, in those words. And I've just come up with uh, two or three questions about those particular terms. Notice that the words were power, authority, control, submission, legitimate power, authority figures, and influence. So let's just talk about three of them, okay? Three of them. Here's the first one, power. Here's my question to you. What kind of things give people power? All right? Money, okay? Money gives individuals power. And I've even seen that happen within the church. Did you know that? Um... I was in a congregation once, and uh, the richest man in the congregation had a daughter who was living in adultery. So I preach a lesson about adulterous marriages, and guess who gets the boot? The preacher gets the boot, and the rich man gets to stay, okay? Because he had done a lot for that congregation. That's exactly what I was told, okay? Uh, one gentleman told me he would support me. Uh, when it got down to the vote, they voted me out. He was one of them that voted me out, so I asked him why. He lied to me, and he says, because Brother Bill has done so much for this congregation. He's given thousands of dollars to this congregation. There is power in what? Money, okay? And um, elders have to be very, very careful uh, not to make their decisions based on what? Not so much money, but a money man. Okay? Uh, they have to be very, very careful. You know, oh, that's going to cause brother so-and-so to get mad. Uh, that's going to cause sister so-and-so to quit giving. Hey, you know, that's not the way to think. That's almost bribery, is it not? Okay? And elders are warned against bribery. What's another thing that gives somebody power? What is it? What is it? Election. election, okay. Fortunately, we don't have uh, election in the church, do we, uh, per se. Uh, so, uh, but election does. You know, just the fact that you are elected, or what we could say is this, just the fact that you've been put into a position gives you power, doesn't it? Okay, and uh, so uh, that, that's another reason that power comes. What's another reason that individuals get power? What is it? Intelligence, yeah, folks. Sometimes, you know, uh, you're a very smart individual. You uh, have, uh, you know, a lot of wisdom. And so there's others who don't know as much as you do about a particular topic or about a particular work. And so you become kind of the guy at the top, don't you? You know, because you have all this intelligence about you. Uh, what are, what's something else? Okay, yes, force. Uh, basically, that's strength, isn't it? Um, and oftentimes, that's the way um, governments operate, isn't it? Against one another. The one who is the strongest, the one who has the greatest military force, the one who has, uh, you know, the greatest uh, ability to overthrow another, they're going to be the ones that are at the top as far as leadership is concerned. And uh, we always hear about the world 
power, don't we? And what we mean by that is the person with the most uh, financial and military strength in the world. And fortunately, uh, that's been the United States for uh, many, many uh, years. Uh, any other things that give you power? What's that now? Relatives in high positions. Yeah, I've gotten down here the backing of others who are powerful. Okay, sometimes you're not that powerful, but because you've got someone behind you who is powerful, uh, that can uh, give you a lot of power. So uh, power can be acquired in a lot of different ways. Uh, the second word I want to talk about for a minute, control. I wrote this down. People say they do not like to be controlled. Isn't that what we say? That's what we say. You know, if I were to ask, how many of you love to be controlled? I bet everybody just raise your, me, I love to be controlled. Okay, there wouldn't be a one of you stick your hand up. Okay, because we don't like to be controlled. Now watch this. But we often allow others to control us very, very easily, folks. So my question is this, why does that happen? Think about that. If I were to ask you, do you like to be controlled? No, you're not controlling me. And then, at the first little ounce of control somebody wields over us, guess what we do? We bow to the authority, don't we? Okay, yes, yeah, sometimes that's it. It's just easier to, uh, it's, it's just easier to yield, isn't it? Okay, there, there, there's, there's no troubles, there's no strife, there's no conflict, uh, there, there's no problems you're going to run into. So it's just easier to yield than it is to stand up and fight against the authority, isn't it? What, what's another reason? Well, very simple, right? Chaos. Okay, what do you mean by that? Okay. Right. So somebody has got to uh, have control. All right. So, or so, individually or as a group. so in our minds, uh, we, we know that control is necessary, that authority is necessary. And so um, we don't want chaos. We don't want uh, strife. And so uh, we know that it's just but better to yield, possibly. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It, it. What's that now? Okay, so yes, yeah, sometimes, you know, we, we have put you in authority. So, therefore, if I've put you in authority, then I'm supposed to submit to your authority. Right? Because that, that seems kind of dumb. It, it, why did I put you in authority if I'm not going to submit to your authority? So uh, that, that makes sense. How about this one? Fear of retribution. Fear of retribution. Folks, you oppose the authority and guess what? The authority will put the hammer down on you. They may use you as an example for everybody else, right? In order to put the fear of the authority in the minds of other individuals. How about this one? Too much trust in authority. Too much trust put in authority. Okay? You see, when we, when we put somebody in authority, we think, or in our minds, we've got this concept, don't we? That this person, if they're there, they must have what? The knowledge to do the job. They must have the wisdom and experience to do the job. They must have the skills to do the job. Surely they know what they're doing. <laughs> What's that? Okay, there's another one. Uh, we assume they have good intentions, right? Uh, most of us, um, you know, when, when we look at people, we're not just harsh and negative and cynical about every person who comes our way, are we? 
And so we want to try to give individuals the benefit of the doubt. We want to give, uh, we want to think, you know, these guys, they're on the up and up. They're trying to do their best. They want to do what's best for us. So we have these concepts in our mind about leadership, but those concepts oftentimes make it very easy for us to be controlled by other people. How about this one? Having to oppose those in positions of power is time-consuming and extremely tiring. Is that tough? You know, all of us will complain when we don't like something. But how many of us will actually get involved to try to change it? That's the toughie, isn't it? You know? It, it, it's easy to find the bad stuff. That, that, that's simple. And it's easy to gripe and complain. That's simple. But it is not easy to be a part of the solution to the problem. That's time consuming. Can be, can it? Can be very expensive. So uh, uh, there's a lot of reasons why we, uh, you know, it, it, just, it just fascinates me that we, that in our minds, I don't want to be controlled. And then we're so easily controlled. It just, it, it, it blows my mind. You know, I've, I've always asked the question, how can one man like Hitler bring a nation to its knees before him? And I'm talking about millions and millions of people. You know, Yeah, but still, you know, e even with that, you know, he's just what? He's just one man. He eats his eggs like I do. He puts his britches on like I do. He gets sick like I do. He got to go to the bathroom like I do. The reason I say all that is to prove he's just what? He's just a man. And yet, sometimes one man can wind up with this power and, this, and, and the people below him who say they don't like to be controlled. How about all the demons in the realm? Oh, yeah. let me tell you, they're working. <laughs> they are at work, absolutely. All right, let's do this. One more. Laws and rules. We have to have laws and we have to have rules, don't we? Here's my question. Why are we so quick to say that just because something is a law, that makes it right. Okay, so now, 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 you've, now you restated that a different way. You say, because we've been taught that laws are right. So we assume that laws are right. So make a law, laws are what? Laws are right, right? That's one that's, you know. Sometimes there might be a law that is wrong or that is a bad instruction, but you're still right in following the government because that submission will lead to less problems down the road. Okay. Um, But they've been doing it since 1973. Right. They've been doing it before 1973. Right. But not fund, they're funding it with taxpayer dollars now more than ever. Oh, sure. But, we, but you know, that's, that's to be expected. Um, the, the real question was, why didn't we blow up like crazy in 1973? You know what I mean? When the law first came into existence, why didn't Christians, I mean, go, go bizonk over that stuff, you know? 
Now it's a law. Oh well, it's a law. <laughs> but it's hard, isn't it? Yep. Let me ask you this. Are most of the laws that we are asked to submit to good? Yeah. Most of the laws, folks, there's thousands of laws, probably millions, you know. And most of the laws that we have to submit to are good laws. You know, and we, and we don't want them changed. Uh, you know, we, we don't even like when they're manipulated, right? You know, we're perfectly satisfied with 70 miles an hour on the interstate, right? Well, some want 100, but, um, you know, but if they change that, that might, we might go crazy over something like that. But for the most part, uh, rules are good, and so uh, you get one or two bad ones, and so you just what? You just kind of put up with it, right? Because we got all these good ones, why just fight so badly over one or two bad ones, Larry. But the basic question is, where did that law come from? Oh, yes. We have to, you know. We're talking about the national, the majority of the people, including the Supreme Court, approved it. Now, where were we when all the others were voting? That may be another Yes. And in our country, they have to be voted on. Uh, and the majority has to agree to that law. Supposedly. Yeah, absolutely. It just uh, it makes it very difficult. But, uh, um, <coughs> folks, we know this too, and this is where we, we're careful. If, if one group begins to doubt one law, then others begin to doubt other laws. Is that true? And so, all of a sudden, rather than being a society of laws, we become a society where everybody just what? Questions the law. And, and, and that throws society into a turmoil as well, don't they, Jim? Oh yeah. Well, that's where governments. That's when governments become corrupt, and and they're and they're big, and they're not what they're supposed to be uh, in society. Uh, it makes it very difficult. All right, let's go to question number two down there. Uh, discuss why we have such an added, such a negative attitude toward authority. You're talking about the leaders. Okay, the authority lies and the authority doesn't tell us the truth. And so uh, because of that, there's a big uh, distrust in authority. Okay, very good. Um, anything else? Yeah, there's a dis distrust in authority. There's also a big distrust on how you get the news. Okay, <laughs> that's a whole different ball game there, isn't it? <clears throat> Uh, and, so we think and yet we won't run for the office. <laughs> it's kind of like those uh, Monday morning quarterbacks, you know. Yes, they could do better job coaching than the coach can. And the person who's complaining about the coach has never coached, probably never hardly played football. <laughs> oh, Kevin. Ah, hypocrisy. Yes, absolutely. It, it happens, doesn't it? Uh, what, what amazes me, turn your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 23. Now remember, the nation of Israel was a nation, was it? Not a physical nation. Okay? And they were, they were ruled and they were governed by whom? Who, who were supposed to be there? Uh, the, the ones who ruled and governed them. 
Okay, yeah, it was, it was the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, you know, the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of the Jews, the high priest. Those were supposed to be their national leaders. Okay, they were the ones who were supposed to be wielding the authority as far as the nation, both physically and spiritually. Okay, well, Jesus, he comes along in uh, Matthew chapter 23, and he says this, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to the disciples, saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That, that statement has always intrigued me. Okay? Because here's what Jesus just said. The scribes and the Pharisees have the most correct interpretation of the law of Moses. They are the ones who sit where? In Moses' seat. Wow. Not the, not the, not the Sadducees, not the Essenes, not the Herodians. Who? The scribes and the Pharisees. He says they sit in Moses' seat. Now listen to what he says. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and what? That observe and do. They're the what? They're the authority. And guess what we're supposed to do? Obey the authority, aren't we? But do ye not after their works, for they say... And do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Religious leaders being hypocrites. That's what he's talking about. They sit in Moses' seat. They're over the nation of Israel. Yeah, you, whatever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But don't you be like them. Because they say in what? Do not. Folks, you don't think God has a heart against hypocrisy when it comes to leaders? It's huge, isn't it? It's huge. And uh, we need to uh, be very aware of that. And when we see hypocrisy, it drives you crazy, doesn't it? Okay? It just drives you crazy. Um, I put under here, uh, individuals who are in authority have abused their authority. Favoritism, bribes, arbitrary application of laws, taking advantage of those under their authority by unreasonable demands, sexual abuse, severe punishment. There's a lot of ways that our authority figures can take advantage of those underneath them, aren't, aren't they? And when we see that, uh, it can cause a lot of trouble and a lot of difficulty and cause a negative attitude toward authority. Um, let's see. Let's go to the next question. We'll run out of time if we don't. Uh... This next question is just uh, a hypothetical, okay? Let's assume for a moment that we have a group of kids, fifth graders, and they walk into their fifth grade class and... Uh, over the announcement, uh, I mean over the intercom system, that class is told, for the entirety of this year, you will have no teacher. Hmm. I wish I was in that fifth grade class. <laughs> Don't you? You know? So here's a class, 25 kids, boys and girls, and no teacher. Chaos. All right. Let's. Beverly spoke out so quickly. What kind of chaos do you envision? Do what now? Ah, pulling hair. All right. You did. You weren't the one pulling hair. You weren't the one pulling hair? No, she was the one taking advantage. So weak, weaker, weaker students are going to be taken advantage of by stronger students, aren't they? Okay. Remember, uh, it's, that, oh, it's that idea of what? Might makes right. Sur right. Survival of the fittest. That's exactly what's going to happen if you don't have a teacher in the room. What else is going to transpire? What's that, Jim? Ah, yes. Uh, there's going to start being groups of people. 
that form within that particular classroom, are there not? Uh, they're they're going to form anyway, but they're going to be even stronger, aren't they? Uh, this little girl gets her hair pulled every day. There may be three or four boys who don't like the boy who's doing that. So guess what they do? They form a group, don't they? But they tell the little girl, there are certain things you've got to do for us, right? So that we'll protect you. So all of a sudden now, we've got little groups in the room that are starting to form uh, to protect one another or to take the lead in that classroom. Okay? Uh, anything else that goes on in that room? Ah, yes. Uh, they, they may, it, it won't just stay in the classroom, will it? You know, now, yes, uh, you know, it, it may not happen in the next classroom if you have a good, strong teacher, right? Because she'll stand and she'll jap slap that little kid and tell him, this is my room, right? You're not going to do that in my room. But, uh, but what about in the hallways? What about in the schoolyard, right? What about on the weekends, you see? Uh, even then, you start having trouble among the classroom. So it doesn't just stay in the classroom, right? Okay, uh, let me ask you this, uh, what do you think, you know, here that classroom has been set up very, very well, right, to be taught day one, what do you think that classroom is going to look like 180 days later? Wouldn't you like to see that? It's going to be torn to pieces, isn't it? Yeah, but we're talking, we're talking about a classroom with no what, no authority, okay, none whatsoever, uh, Kevin? Okay, let me ask you this. Do you think there would be some children in that classroom who'd get traumatized by the experience? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Folks, we're, we're, about, we're about to get some kids hurt. We're about to get some kids that are going to be very, very traumatized. Probably uh, their parents would pull them out of school completely, wouldn't they? Because they're, they're, or, or their children are not going back to school, or they're going to skip that class, whatever it is. We're not going there because of what's... Um, uh, happening. Um, Another thing would happen is that the principal would be replaced. Well, I, now see, y- y'all are thinking too literally. Okay, I'm trying. What? what no, no, I'm serious. What I'm trying to picture is all I'm trying to picture is what a world without what, without authority. This is an example. Okay, you know, you don't, you don't have to go to the nth of the moon, okay, uh, and if he didn't take it, the supervisor, the superintendent would be there. If the superintendent didn't do it, the mayor would get on him. Um, no, I'm trying just to, here's what happens when you don't have what? Authority. Even in within just a small little area, like a classroom. Folks, here's the first thing that I put, and nobody has said anything about it, and I've been kind of shocked. Okay. There would be no learning. And why do you go to school? <laughs> Sean says to have fun. <laughs> he's been in one of those classrooms. <laughs> That's why he's in the military right now. <laughs> there, there's ways of dealing with those little kids. Um, but, uh, you, know, you know, you send your child to learn. And folks... If there's no teacher, if there's no instruction, if there's just sheer chaos, if there's the constant struggle for fighting, if there's the tearing up of everything, if there's a harming of other people, then guess what? There's no learning. The very purpose for which that organization was designed is destroyed, isn't it? Okay. Now, you can take that and you can put that into any scenario. Okay. Can't you? You know, you don't have to just limit it to a classroom. Okay, anywhere that these kind of things are happening where there is no authority. So, uh, you know, even though we'll have problems with authority, we've got to what? We've got to have it, don't we? How about the congregation? The congregation of church. Oh, yes. If you, if you don't have elders, it can get rough. Okay, it can get rough with elders. But I'm serious, I've been in both, Okay. In the notes, I listed some systems of authority, okay? Um, I got a couple of questions, all right? First of all is this. 
If a theocracy were to exist, how does it come to pass? Chosen. I don't know. Now what is a theocracy? Now let's, let's, let's get the, defini- the true definition of a theocracy. No. God ruled. That's what theocracy means. God ruled. Now, think about that. If a theocracy is going to exist, how is it going to exist? God is going to have to what? Authorize it. Okay? Oh, see, it's the only way for a theocracy to exist. The only way. Okay? If God doesn't authorize a theocracy, then guess what? You can't have a government ruled by whom? By God. It's an impossibility. Now, people may try to say that a certain God rules over this particular group of people, but just to say it doesn't make it what? Doesn't make it so. Okay? Uh, and, and, Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, and, that, and yeah, that's the point, you know. Here you have the, the system of Islam, and they say that that system is ruled by who? Allah, okay, their God, Allah, and that He has given His rules, He has given His uh, uh, authority, and, it, and it's supposed to govern what? Not just the religion, but what? The nation, okay? The nation. And that's the reason that they want their courts put into any system in which they find themselves. Okay, we want to be ruled by who? Our God, not your God. Okay, so, uh, uh, but, if, but if a theocracy is ever going to exist, it's going to have to be God who authorizes it. And uh, has God authorized a theocracy anymore? No. The only theocracy that God has today is a spiritual kingdom called the church, isn't it? That's the only theocracy that exists. And the church is a spiritual kingdom. It's not a physical kingdom. So a huge difference. Uh, Listen to these points right here. Okay, Remember I made made mention a while ago, one man rising to a position of authority. How does one man rise to a position of ultimate authority in a nation as a dictator? Number one, he takes position of power at an opportune time. Okay, so in other words, there is some luck that's involved in it. Okay, bad things have been happening in the nation. Uh, maybe there's been, you know, terrible financial distress. Maybe they're coming out of a terrible war, whatever it is. Okay, and all of a sudden, this man comes in and he can what? He can, he can help with the problem. So he's elected to position at an opportune time. Number two, take over of the military. Number three, find ways to stockpile money and wealth as quickly as possible once installed in office. Number three, create projects, even if they are not profitable, that are said to benefit the people. You've got to convince the people what? That that we're benefiting you, that we're helping you. So, you know, 10,000 projects, whether whether they're good or not, but they're thrown out there as a benefit to the people. Number four, take over the media in order to control the propaganda heard by the people. Okay? Number six, use every possible means to cheat during elections. And number seven, use fear and intimidation against all those who oppose you. It's, it's, uh, it's, that, that's the way dictators, that's the way one man rules enter into nations of people, folks. And so, uh, you know, it's very, very, uh, we, we need to be aware of those things. Drop down to number five. Number five. Discuss the chain of spiritual authority. In that, we have this. God spoke, right? He then delegated His authority to who? Jesus Christ. All power hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth. And Jesus said, when I leave, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to send you another comforter, the Holy Spirit. So now that authority has been passed to whom? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, however, is going to reveal the message, not 
just to everybody, who's He going to reveal it to? Apostles, prophets, what we refer to as inspired men, right? And then eventually, what are those men going to do? They're going to write it down in this book. Okay? So that is the what? That's the spiritual chain of authority within the church of our Lord and Savior. Okay? Now, here's something that's interesting. Why did God choose to reveal His will through the written Word? Why didn't He just appear to each of us and talk to each of us? Okay, but He's going to be eternal. He's he not going anywhere. But He can say the same thing to you as He does to me. In my house. Yeah. Yeah, he just come talk to you, Brett, you know. Assembly of God people say that God talks to them every day. Yeah. You know, actually but I'm saying, why did, why did God choose the written word versus just coming and talking to all of us? Okay. But it, Ah, now you hear that? Okay. Now, now if, God, if God did talk to everybody, okay, just personally, okay, um, He'd either have to talk to all of us at the same time, right? He'd have to give us all the same message, or, like you said, we could have people lie, right? And so, then we got a mess on our hands, don't we? We do. Because they don't get into the root words like you do and the truth about every single word and every verse and every book of the Bible. That's it. It, it can still be a problem, the, the interpretation part of it. What about this one, folks? When you have, when you, if I were to wake up today and say, hey guys, last night God appeared to me and this is the message that He wants me to give to you. What is the only way I can confirm that message? Well, in times past, they didn't have the written word in the first century. Well, not not to do. So, how did they confirm the word? Huh? They had to have. They had the way God confirmed the, the spoken word in times past was through miracles. Okay, that's the way it was done. It was confirmed by miracles. We, we talked about Moses. You know, Moses was supposed to go to the children of Israel and tell them, I'm the deliverer. I'm going to, you know, uh, God's told me that I want you to, uh, Pharaoh, to let Israel go. They won't believe me. Well, what did he say? Yeah, throw the rod down. It became a what? What about when, when Mary uh, had a, uh, when the angel came to Mary, and even Joseph Oh yeah, he didn't believe it, right. you know, he had a, a revelation, yep. Yeah. But you see, the problem in the first century was, is that if I come with a message and I have a miracle, another man can come with a message and have magic. Yeah. Not a miracle, magic. And so, what if his magic appears to be greater than my miracle? Who are you going to believe? Huh? <laughs> see, he, the... Then, then, I'm, then I'm going to believe... See, why didn't, why didn't Pharaoh believe Moses during those first three plagues? Because they had these sorcerers that could do all these tricks. They could do the same thing right. that Moses was doing. But it finally came to an end of that, right? And now Moses overpowered those magicians. And, they couldn't, and then they had to admit, this has to be what? The finger of God. But if you can't control that, okay? What if Sandy's a better magician than I am a miracle worker? We've got a problem, right? It's just that way. Um, once the written form is here, it's concrete, it's static, and guess what? It can't be changed, it can't be manipulated, can it? 
And you and I can have a thus saith the Lord. Let me ask you this. What are some of the weaknesses in the chain of biblical authority? Are there any? Are there any weaknesses at all? None? Kevin? Yes. Because God injected man into the process, right? They're that fourth step and they're the ones who actually pin the message, then a lot of people, because they don't understand the previous steps in the chain of authority, just think, well, this book's just been written by men. Okay, and so that, that makes it a little bit, we have, we have to do some convincing, don't we, and some teaching of individuals. So that's one of the weaknesses. Um, what's another weakness in the chain of authority? Okay, what do you mean by that? Okay. And there's no individual that I can go see, okay, that's, that's God. All right. So it's, it's very there difficult to... to there has to be an aspect of faith. Okay, yes, there has to be an element of faith is, in that. And there's, there's no tangible something that you can necessarily grab a hold of. Okay, Jeannie? Ah, yes, the, the transmission and translation of Scripture. That poses a problem, does it not, for some individuals. Okay, uh, The problem there again is they just haven't been taught very well. They just haven't been instructed very well with regard to those processes. Uh, one more. Who? Yes. Right. Yeah, and that's that transmission process that we talked about. She made sure the, the passing a message, you know, you get a message from one person and you call and pass the message on and you call and pass the message on. And by the time the fifth or sixth person has it, it ain't anywhere near where it used to be. The biggest uh, misinterpretation really of all is baptism in the Bible. Well, there's a bunch of them back there, a bunch of them. Jim? Sure. Right. Yeah, there's, there's definite uh, confirmation. Guys, the last question was this. Why don't men respect the authority of the Word of God? There's one main reason. You want to know what it is? Man doesn't want to be controlled by God. That's as simple as it is. And guess what? Sometimes we, as Christians, find ourselves in that camp. I don't care what God says. I'm going to do what I want to. Oh, man. You know what they call that? They just call that another, they call that Christian atheism. Isn't that something? Ooh, that's scary, isn't it? 